Hello, everyone, and welcome to the World Built Environment Forum webinar series. My name is Tina Paye, and today you'll be hearing about whole life carbon recording for Europe's buildings and the importance of a consistent methodology for assessing whole life emissions. You'll also be getting the lowdown from the experts on the key regulations such as EPBD and CPR. And if you're not familiar with those terms, we're going to explain them, as well as the sustainable finance taxonomy. We'll also explore the effective implementation of these future policy provisions and the requirements and challenges ahead. Before I introduce the panel, I'd like to offer a little context and explain why this is so important. Climate change is already imposing heavy costs on Europe. Last year, drought in Europe led to 20 billion euros in costs, an extra 20,000 heat-related deaths. Wildfire activity was far above the average of the 15 previous years. In Spain, nearly 300,000 hectares burnt, four times more than its average for those 15 years. Set aside the social impact, and even then, we're in the property business. So that scale of threat and risk that's impacting property should matter to us. But what can we do? We can reduce carbon emissions. The answer is as simple and as complicated as that. According to the EU, buildings are responsible for around 40% of energy consumption and 36% of its greenhouse gas emissions. Nearly three quarters of EU building stock doesn't meet energy efficiency standards. Yet, over 85% of those properties will still be operating in 2050. The EU has had an energy performance of buildings directive since 2010 with various revisions. This states that as of 2028, all new buildings must be zero emissions. For new public infrastructure, that date is 2026, only a few years away. It also mandates minimum energy performance for existing buildings. For residential, this is class E by 2030 and class D by 2033. For non-residential and public buildings, it's 2027 and 2030. Those deadlines are all within 10 years. Most are by the end of this decade. So that's urgent because key decision points are happening now. There is much more to this challenge, especially when we get into the practicalities, which I'm sure our panel will explain. I'd like now to introduce our stellar panel, Julie Emrich, Sustainable Finance Lead at World Green Building Council. Julie, can you tell us a few words about yourself? Hello, everyone, and thank you, Tina. Uh, so uh, I'm Julie Emmerich. I'm indeed the Sustainable Finance Lead at the World Green Building Council. Uh, the World Green Building Council is a network of 77 green, uh, national green building councils, and we represent 46,000 members uh, at the global scale. Um, and I'm personally in charge of uh, looking over all our activities related to sustainable finance. And one of the activities we have at uh, the World GBC is uh, specifically looking at the EU taxonomy, but we also uh, aim to find alignment uh, in what we call the ESG ecosystem in the real estate sector. I'm happy to talk more about that later on. So thanks for having me today. Thank you for being here, Julie. Really looking forward to hearing more about that. Our next panelist is Luca De Giovanetti. And Luca is currently Senior Manager Built Environment at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Luca, could you introduce yourself? Thank you, Tina. Hi, everyone. Uh, happy to be here. 
So yeah, my name is Luca De Giovanetti. I, at WBCSD, which we are a global membership organization with well over 200 of the global companies, we really work on driving sustainability in the, built, in the private sector and driving sustainability at climate, nature, and inequalities are the key priority. But yeah, for the work on the built environment that I'm leading on decarbonization and circularity, <coughs> definitely uh, the climate is the main aspect, but yeah, important to consider all the rest. And for us, it's really how we create a systemic approach to decarbonize the built environment, achieving the global target to halve emission 2013 at zero 2050 by bringing the entire system together. So happy to be here. Great, great to have you, Luca. And I can't wait to hear more about your ideas around market transformation. Our next speaker is Amit Patel. Amit is head of professional practice for construction at RICS. Amit, welcome, and can you introduce yourself? Thank you, Tina. I uh, would like to say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who's who's kind of logged in today. Uh, my name's, uh, like I said, Tina mentioned. My name's Amit Patel. I'm the head of professional practice at the RACS. We manage the the professional standards of how and what we should do as as, as a membership organisation, as uh, as professionals. Um, and our aim is to making sure that from from an environmental perspective that we use the standards that we use the mechanisms that we have to capture the data to ensure that we're having the best chance of making sure we're reaching our goals uh, especially into the environment going forward great thanks thanks for that Amit and we'll be hearing more about that standard very soon from you um last but definitely not least Zolt Toth team leader at Buildings Performance Institute Europe Zolt, could you introduce yourself and welcome? Sure, many thanks, Tina. It's um, great to talk to you. So my name is Joel Todd. I'm based in Brussels. Um, I'm team leader at um, the Building Performance Institute Europe, which is a independent policy think tank. Um, over the past 10, 12 years, um, we have defined this building performance almost exclusively in terms of operational emissions and operational energy performance um, but very much in line with the discussion of the webinar today um, we have uh, also sort of brought in the um, impact of embodied emissions that are related to, 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 to the building materials and I think it's unsurprisingly the the fact that our focus was very much in line with um, building policies um, but now we see, of course, a mushrooming of uh, new initiatives and an, uh, a quite important um, expansion of the scope of building policies to cover the entire life cycle. So we'll talk about this in a second. Back to you, Tina. Great. Thanks, Zolta. And I now am going to introduce a few uh, general questions. So for the panel, just uh, raise your raise your finger and let me know if you want to respond to this one. Because to begin, I just alluded to the scale of the challenge. It's not a small one. And my question is, is the sector on track to decarbonize or are we falling behind? What is working and what isn't? Maybe we'll start with Julie. Yes, happy to come in. Uh, yeah, interesting question. I think we repeatedly discussed this one uh, at different conferences and it's it's an important one to have. I hope one day the uh, answer will change, but I think for now, uh, the the what we're seeing in the market, and of course, at the World Green Building Council, we have uh, some insights from over 46,000 members worldwide, but um, we're, we're nowhere, basically, the, the uh, kind of scale and uh um sorry speed of change that we need to achieve uh to keep the global european climate goals and and sustainable development goals um so we're seeing progress of course uh but usually it's in a few percent of the market so there is a massive need to upscale all the efforts that we're uh, talking about uh, including those that we will be discussing here 
today. And maybe one thing I'd like to raise that on, on what is going well, I think we are seeing that the market is grasping better the concept of what a green building or decarbonized transition mm -hmm. path looks like. Um, there is increasingly uh, investment into energy efficiency in buildings uh, with an increase of almost 15% uh, from 2021 to 2022. But at the same time, uh, we're also seeing a major lack of awareness, for example, on the concept of embodied carbon, whole life cycle uh, emissions. Uh, we're also, I think, not super on the clear yet in the real estate market on um, the, the major risk that business as usual poses. So I think you alluded to it in your introduction, Tina, but uh, we're, we're also already seeing first buildings maybe being stranded or even whole neighborhoods. We're seeing uh, some parts of earth not being insurable anymore uh, if you have buildings there because of the first impacts of climate change and this is only gonna spiral. So it's a nuanced answer, uh, but yeah. Overall, I think it's just a lot of work in front of us. Yeah, no, I, I, I think you've hit it spot on. And I think when you're saying that, you know, there's a better awareness of operational carbon, but the embodied carbon remains and the whole life cycle carbon remains a bit of a um, an unknown for a number of players on the market today. That's an important point that whole life carbon assessments will um, address. And the other thing I'm taking away from what you're saying is that a lot of assets and some areas are already feeling the heat and the pressure of climate change. And that will bring awareness, but perhaps in a very, very painful manner uh, to some uh, populations and to some of those uh, real estate investors that are invested in those areas. Um, Luca, I see you nodding your head. Do you want to add something into that or 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 challenge the answer? Mm. Maybe you think we're on track and everything's going well. Mm. What do you think? Well, I mean, I fully agree with what Julie said. Um, and at the, you know, are we on track? Of course not. <laughs> the Global Alliance for Building and Construction, the Global Status Report, which is published every year, and BPA is key contributor to that report, well, shows that emissions are still at all time high uh, and is still increased. The challenge is that the efficiency gain are outpaced by the growth of the, uh, the, the construction growth. So we need to do much more to really bend down the curve. Uh, are we doing the right things? Yes, I think definitely there is a lot of signal of things that are right. Uh, scale, scale is the big challenge. How we make sure that it's scaled and it's prioritized in the decision we make. So, you know, I think uh, carbon, we know what that this is an important factor, but probably is not yet at that level of decision making that we need to make really the, the, the to really change the curve. So if we, the common vision that we re always refer is that by 2030, all new buildings should be net zero in operation and at least 40 to 50% reduction on embodied carbon. Well, that's we need to make sure that we practice, we put in practice and we put in practice now because the building that will be constructed in 2030 are designed now. So we really need to make sure that we start today to design it in that way if we really want to achieve the goal. So I think there is a lot of signals, a lot of important message, but yeah, we definitely need to do more. Great. And uh, Emmett, do you want to comment that. Yeah. on that? Yeah, I mean, I can echo what, what Lucas said. We we are so far off the mark at the moment. I think we you know, we we need there needs to be a total step change about how we do things and you know whether or not it's is is it going to be us as an organisation that's going to push us forward or is it going to be uh, are we looking for political statements? Are we looking for you know legislation to get behind this to get to get this moving because we can all see the effects of climate change now you know this is visible this is actual tangible things we're seeing um we have to reconsider that you know it, it, do, do we make this mock now um it's, it's as lucas said the buildings that we're building now uh, you know we could you know we start reducing we st could start reducing what we look at at that 40 percent um but it, it, as as you said tina we look at the existing stock the existing buildings that are still going to be here that are still going to be 
heavily training in terms of carbon usage, in terms of heating, ventilation, operating those buildings. You know, what, what are we doing around those? What, are, what you know, what what are the solutions around those? What are we doing about um, how we manage those buildings? You know, those assets, those assets that are that are managed as well, those assets that are owned. Um, so there's a whole kind of, you know, yes, we can do the right thing. There's a whole kind of financial system behind it as well that's propping up mm. those buildings. So we need to kind of consider, are we are we doing the right thing now? Probably not. We can do more. Well, you know, we can look at going and kind of stem it up where we're looking at feasibilities, outline planning, master planning and thinking, mm. actually, are we making the best choices now for, for the future generations? Um, and the question was, you know, what could we do going forward? Uh, we, could, we could do a lot more. We can look at sustainable sources of materials, energy consumption, where you know where the power of the grid comes from, sharing of technology. We can look at sharing data, for for example. You know that's a that's a major impact of what we what we're doing at the moment. Um, we need to understand how much it is that we're you know each building is is currently emitting, which is what kind of the roadmap we're we're looking at at the moment. But we we need to, to understand how comparable is that. You know what are the what are the limits? You know are we really you know, when we sort of talk about net zero, uh, you know, 2050, how how realistic is that? If, we, if we, we've got we've got to undo what we've done in the last 100, 200 years in the next 30 years. Absolutely. So hold that thought because we're going to be mm -hmm. answering some of those questions, hopefully mm -hmm. a little bit later in the session. Um, Zolt, what are your thoughts? Are we on track? What are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? Well. I wish. Uh, what are we not uh, doing? <laughs> <laughs> no, certainly I, I would wish to to contradict the the other panelists, but I just simply I can't. So I I will just nod to to everything which has been said before. But maybe I will I will just contradict you, Tina, because in your opening when you stated the um, the size uh, and the urgency um, that we have that we currently face, um, and you quoted the 36 percent of greenhouse gas emissions coming from from buildings in Europe. Um, that figure is likely to be even a low estimate. It is possible that if we have a life cycle approach, so if, if, if we are really good and, and much more granular in accounting all the responsible emissions, um, therefore probably we will end up in, in, in the region of 41%. So that is just to emphasize even more um, the baseline from where we are going to make all these changes. Now, um, I think Maybe it would be good to, at this point, to, to shed some insights on um, on a report that we have been, a technical study that we have been preparing for the uh, European policymakers um, to, to basically assess the baseline and then from there to draw a decarbonization pathway and to explain what does it mean actually in concrete terms in, in terms of policy, but also for the for, for the industry. And um, so starting from this baseline. Having in mind the, the, the current um, available policies and, and, and policy landscape driving decarbonization, we accounted for, we modeled for something like 32% uh, emission reductions, which is like is, 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 is still very, very far away from what carbon neutrality or net zero carbon requires us. And interestingly, a lot of these um, carbon reductions are driven by emission reductions in the use phase. And as Julie was saying that there is quite a lot of awareness in terms of energy efficiency, energy performance metrics, and, and, and even investment into this field. Um, but a lot of these savings are actually offset by this, this growth of, um, the exist of, of floor area in the building stock, that are, the fact that our buildings and, and, and the space per capita is, is increasing and maybe it's increasing unsustainably. And, and this is what probably Amit was um, alluding to, the fact that we have to undo a lot of what we have done over the last 100 years. And yes, a lot of low carbon measures and, and strategies are available, but even with that, we have models um, a reduction potential of something like 68% with this lifestyle life stain, which means that yes, these are available, but we need to do more. So I think we will also have to look at um, the way how we are going to use buildings, the way our, how we are deciding to demolish a building and, and, and build new, how these decisions come up and, and basically try to reduce the amount of um, new constructions and, and, and use the existing resources, use the existing stock as, 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 as much as possible and try to think, try to do the right thing rather than doing things right. Excellent. I couldn't agree with you more, Zolt. Um, the whole uh, 
you know, increase of space per capita and the embodied carbon conundrum is really going to be key in getting around the issues that we have to meet our targets. And I think um, I think whole life carbon assessment uh, will shine a light on that, uh, as well as perhaps thresholds and regulation, which brings me to um, my next question which is that the EU has really taken a leading role in decarbonization initiatives. We have things like the EPBD, the CPR, and the Whole Life Carbon Roadmap, or WLC to use all the acronyms. Could you decode some of these acronyms for the audience and explain what those initiatives are each trying to do? And how well do they actually align with the broader goal of achieving climate neutrality by 2050? I think we're going to go in reverse order. I'm going to let Zolt go first on this one, because I know you're you're very, very much up to speed on some of these uh, decarbonization initiatives and, and policies. Over to it's, you. It's true. Thank you, Tina. We, we are following um, policy developments very closely because, um, as, as, as you mentioned, a number of key pieces of legislation are, are, are being reviewed as we speak and are being subjected to, to policy negotiations. Um, I think one of the key issues that you mentioned was that the lack of alignment between policy ambition um, and, and basically climate neutrality goals. Um, and I take this maybe even a step further. Um, the, the current metrics that we have and, and, and European building policy policies have been based on, and these were mostly energy efficiency, and, and therefore building requirements in terms of nearly zero energy buildings or zero emission buildings even, they are not really aligned with what climate neutrality would require. And I, that I see that is, 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 is really difficult um, also for, for, for the wider real estate and construction sector to comprehend as well, because simply for an investor or for a developer, a net zero emission, a net zero energy building or a zero emission building, it doesn't say if it's aligned with the decarbonization pathway in terms of um, carbon emissions or it's not. So there is this gradual change and, and recognition um, of the need of, of moving away from energy and energy efficiency metrics towards, um, towards carbon emissions and, and preferably life cycle emissions. And this is not to move away from one thing to another, but more like to have like a more complementary approach. And I think um, policymakers have recognized uh, the fact that um, we need uh, a life cycle approach. And, and, and that, doesn't, that doesn't mean necessarily in, in terms of the construction practices and, and real estate practices, but also in terms of policymaking is very, very important because um, up until now we had like si siloed policy development, um, targeting products, targeting buildings, and these were not very well aligned. So now I think we have an opportunity to align this much better. And again, I will just make a mention to the um, EU Whole Life Carbon Roadmap, which is currently being developed as a sort of blueprint for future European uh, building policies, because this has the opportunity with a very strong focus on whole life carbon emissions. It has the opportunity to look at the, the, the cross impacts, the potential synergies and trade-offs between demand side and supply side policies between different stages of the, of the life cycle, but also between product building level policies, but also the wider building stock, because that's ultimately, that is very important from a climate change point of view and, 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 and the global carbon budgets. So yeah, Great. there is a lot of, lot of action happening, but anything what I would be able to say on this point, I, I just wanted to say that is, is, is provisional because the, the, the political negotiations are ongoing, uh, but very likely to have very strong whole life carbon regulation um, concluded by, by the beginning of December still this year. Mm. So if I might take away from what you've just said is that the whole life carbon roadmap will be a key piece to underpin uh, it means not only does the EPBD and the CPR and other regulations need to include whole life carbon measurement, but that the whole life carbon roadmap um, could be a key piece to bring in uh, even other legislation, including things like uh, waste management, circularity, um, 
and other items that feed into the whole life carbon. I think I think it will be a key piece of information because it will show the way forward. Um, and it will, like you said, it will just explain how these various pieces of legislation will interact and how this will all converge towards um, having a overall uh, carbon budget for a building or for the building stock, for national building stock. That will be very important because based on that, policymakers will also be able to set these limit values towards um, which basically building regulations will have to be um, aligned with. I think it's important because it will provide this sort of long-term outlook because it's, it's, it's not enough to talk about 2050 as the end goal for um, a climate neutrality um, uh, building stock. It's, I think, also very important how we get there because, as we know, carbon has a time value and basically, we longer delay this process, we need more assertive policies because it's more difficult it will get to stay within the uh, the, the, the remaining carbon budget. Mm, absolutely. I think I'm going to skip over to Julie because I want to ask Julie something a little related to the question I've just asked, which is about the sustainable finance taxonomy. This is a really critical aspect of driving sustainability in the built environment as well. How is whole life carbon addressed within the taxonomy, um, otherwise known as the EU taxonomy for a lot of people? And what sort of discussions are taking place regarding the inclusion of whole life carbon thresholds within the EU taxonomy? Julie? We all are yes, we're all ears. We're all ears. This and this is insider, just for the audience. This is insider information. No one knows what's going on in the sustainable finance um, inner circles, and Julie does. So this is going to be really interesting. Over to you. I think you're over promising, but uh, yeah, I'm happy to take the question <laughs> nevertheless. <laughs> um, so maybe just a, a quick 10 second drawback on, you know, the EU taxonomy isn't there alone. It's part of a sustainable finance policy package uh, along with, uh, so to add a few acronyms to, to the list you mentioned, there is the uh, SFDR, so the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation, mandating financial institution uh, and their funds to, to kind of be more transparent in what they're investing in. Uh, there is also the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, so uh, CSRD, mandating companies in the market to uh, be more transparent about the economic activities they have um, and, and reporting along a whole, I think it's 100 plus indicators on, on ESG. So there is this whole disclosure part uh, going on in the EU that I think, you know, that, that's a big game changer. And then there's the EU taxonomy, which kind of the way I see it sits in the middle of both because it's a kind of a tool to describe what is a green investment, what is a green uh, economic activity. So how do you, how do you do the reporting from a company to the you know to the finance sector, and how to ensure that it talk the same uh, language? So that's the quick background I wanted to bring in. And then to address your uh, question, it's it's a um, maybe disappointing answer to the audience, but the EU taxonomy actually currently doesn't really include any criteria on whole life carbon. Um, you know, and the EU taxonomy is meant to redirect finance flows in the European market to put, at, uh, uh, to put us collectively as a European uh, market and society on the path to a decarbonized and sustainable, um, um, well, yeah, economy and society, and spe uh, specifically also uh, decarbonized built environment. So there is a massive gap at the moment. Uh, of course, you know, the EU taxonomy climate change criteria came out 2021. A lot has happened since, uh, one could argue. And as Salt was uh, explaining, uh, well, you know, there is a whole um, negotiations around the key European energy law, the EPBD, which will address all buildings, right? It, it's a it's a minimum performance law. So the EU taxonomy being more targeting the front runners in the market, obviously will need updating. Um, and I think also to be very clear, the EU taxonomy 
does refer to whole life carbon and specifically life cycle global warming potential, but it only addresses uh, buildings that are over 5,000 square meters big and also doesn't have any criteria really, just mandates the disclosure of the data. And uh, I think data though is a, is a massive barrier. It's currently often, uh, you know, the key uh, barrier to more circularity, to lower embodied carbon and the construction and renovation phase, along with kind of a lacking market. Like there is um, some, some national green building councils in our network did a study looking at the state of the market to implement some of the criteria in the e-taxonomy and specifically also to the circularity criteria. It's very difficult to comply with them because the market isn't in place yet. So this means coming back to you know alignment of regulation, you also then need regulation towards the suppliers to create an ecosystem, uh, like a, to create the market that is necessary to then be able to uh, go towards a kind of lower embodied carbon in the construction phase or in the renovation phase or in the procuring of materials. So yeah, I hope next year uh, there will be an update on the taxonomy to include whole life carbon. And I think this will be very dependent on the EPPD outcome by the end of the year, Sol was uh, uh, referring to. Yeah, really, really insightful. And I think maybe I'm wrong, but my <laughs> main takeaway from that is that the EU taxonomy needs to have more teeth and that maybe those teeth will come uh, on the back of an EPBD regulation on whole life carbon thresholds. But today, it, it's, as you're saying, it only mandates the data reporting. It doesn't, it, it's there to channel financial investment towards green investment. It's there to avoid greenwashing, but it's not necessarily having any teeth when it comes to things like carbon reduction uh, and thresholds and measurement through whole life carbon. So um, a useful piece uh, to put things together, but it probably needs to be beefed up if we want it to really help us get where we need to get. And I think this um, brings me to a question for Luca, which is why is it important to have better alignment in whole life carbon measurement and reporting at the EU, but also at global level? And what could be done next to achieve that? Do you agree that it means we have to put more teeth into some of our legislation? What, 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 are, what are your views? And, and also, um, if you could touch on the whole issue of market transformation, which I know is, is key to this. Over to you, Luca. Yeah, thanks. I mean, the importance of having better alignment on whole life carbon is because, of course, it doesn't help anyone if, depending on the geography, you have a different interpretation or a different definition of what, how we measure whole life carbon or what do we mean for net zero buildings and so on. And, but let's stay into the whole life carbon, you know, like at the moment, various countries, they have different interpretation or different definition on measurement of whole life carbon different kind of aspect on quantifying some uh, uh, consideration and this in the European uh, Union alone but then when we look at global at global level as well uh, US as well there is different uh, uh, standards and then of course ca companies as well uh, all company or no, not all, many companies are conducting all life carbon calculation of the buildings but there is no kind of uh, uh, un unified standard and that brings the challenge that having to adapt their whole life carbon calculation based on the country, if there is some requirement. So that might be that a company that operates in 10, 20, 50 countries, they might have different interpretation on how to calculate if they need to report to some specific country regulation. So that's a waste of resource, but also then a lack of comparability because a number from one country versus the other might not be in the same. So this is why it's so important that we create an alignment on the way we report all that carbon, having key considerations and kind of better uh, working on some key principles that would enable 
maybe not necessary to harmonize everything, that will be obviously a long shot, but at least enable this kind of basic comparison and allow for everybody to make sure where to start. I mean, I like to bring the example of Aru, that they decided to commit to all that carbon to all their buildings. They had to develop an internal methodology to calculate that throughout all the countries that operate in all the, um, all the different geography. So, because then, you know, you need to make sure that you have the right data for each country. Europe might be easier to get some data compared to maybe other uh, regions, so where data are more lacking. So, and to create this better way that eventually it provides something that internally company can use. But then, of course, that means waste of resource. We have to develop our own methodology or so. So, then what we really need is to make sure that there is kind of a, a movement that brings together what are the different standards? RIC has they published the professional, the state, the standard, uh, the new standard on life carbon. That's a good way, a good step into that kind of creating something that is of broader recognition and making sure that everybody is uh, kind of aligned. Because then, of course, once we have a common way to measure, then there is many different things that can be done. So that's definitely why the importance of all life carbon. And then. If you want, I, I can touch base on the market transformation work, as you mentioned. So this is an initiative that uh, is led under the Global Alliance for Building and Construction, the work area on market transformation, where back uh, two years ago at COP26, we presented the um, net zero levers, for market transformation levers, and really focus on what are the key enablers, two key enablers, a common vision and a deep collaboration and three key levers to achieve the net zero uh, objective. And one key lever is all life carbon. The other one is making sure we look at carbon the same way we look at cost when we do the, the construction and the and decision, and then really driving this supply and demand dynamics. So an all life carbon is really a key enabler because it really enables various steps. And when we, in the market transformation, the discussion was not what do I need from the other, but rather what I can bring to the system transformation as a stakeholder from the system, being a business company. And that's again, depending on where on the value chain the company is, they can bring different uh, aspects, data, requests for all life carbon information, uh, providing uh, demand for that, but then also governments, uh, uh, public procurement or, uh, enforcement or kind of putting a regulation that demands some specific aspect financial sector as a key enabler for the transformation and the broader let's say civil society all organization as well on creating these alignment so now the work the market transformation we're working now towards working on specific actions like based on these enablers what are the barriers and action that enable that need to be implemented within this framework to drive this intervention that would accelerate the transformation. What are really stopping us to get eventually? The question you asked before, are we gonna get there? What can we do? So really, how? what can we do to accelerate the transformation? Because we know what we need to do, but why are we not still getting the right process and progress? So what can be done in the system to really drive this? And in there, again, Mark, uh, All Life Carbon is a key driver and this alignment is really one of the key aspects that will enable to accelerate uh, the. So now we we're planning to launch the to finalize this work. Uh, so we're gonna have another uh, workshop uh, at COP this year. But then we want to pre present it in line uh, and showing what is the known government actions can be done in collaboration with the Building Breakthrough. That is an initiative done by France and Morocco, which is gonna be. Uh, announced at COP, but then presented at next year, March uh, 24 in Paris, which may be an important date for everybody. So, uh, it's the first ministerial event will take place in Paris next year. Uh, and it's really bringing together all ministers globally and bringing, so really discussing about climate and building. So it's the Global uh, Building and Climate Forum for the 7th and 8th of March next year. So big day to mark because it's really where I would say the broader built environment community can get together 
and emphasize what we do all here uh, as organization as companies and so and bringing together with the government initiatives at global level so that's great bit great of answer, but yeah, there was a few everyone your mark your mark your calendars 7th and 8th of march uh building breakthrough in for france and morocco but taking place in paris excellent um, I think we're starting to field a few questions uh, from the audience, and please feel free to put them in. Um, Julie has responded in part to to a first question, but we, we will I will get to the questions in just a few minutes. I'd like to ask um, one more question, and then we'll open up to the audience questions. And the last question is for Amit. Um, and and I know uh, Luca had been leading on to this, but I, I think the question for you, which would could be really interesting to hear about, is what is the impact of RICS carbon assessment standard in meeting the 2050 goals? Luca gave us the highlight saying we need global standards. We yeah. need to measure to improve, we need these standards to be comparable from one country to the other. How do you see the RICS carbon assessment standard, whole life carbon assessment standard, helping to meet our 2050 decarbonization goals? Yeah, so just going back on what Luke was saying, we need standardization, we need data sets, and we need transparency uh, within the market as well. So we need to understand, you know, once, this, once the exercise has been carried out at certain points, we need to understand what the rigor is behind it, what the transparency around the data disclosure, where does that go to, where does it, where is it held? And we need to look at ourselves and say, actually, how do we compare against um, city to city, country to country, asset to asset, and looking at those, and, and also exploring the nature of how we got there. So, you know, we're still in the infancy. So what we need to understand is that, you know, we, I think we uh, look just kind of spitting out some facts at the moment. So 70% of our members had never carried out a whole life carbon assessment. So it just goes to show that we're still in the infancy of doing so. Um, but once, you know, this is a mandatory uh, competency. So once we get to a stage where each building and each asset has been recorded in that same effective method and it's standardized and we're recording data and then we're recording it in operation. So we've got actual data to compare against. Once we get that to a, get to that stage, we get legislation to say actually what are the targets, what is the minimum requirement that we need to be to get to net zero, um, and then we can bridge the gap to understand actually what what you know what are the impacts that we need to do, how far up the I say uh, that that kind of design process do we need to work to make sure that we're eliminating that that kind of optioneering phase to making sure we're making sure that the building is efficient as possible. So then you know it's got the longevity, it's reduced its carbon overall and it's in operation as well so i think we yes correct we you know we are way far off the mark but we are still in the infancy in terms of capture that data we need the transparency and we need to we need systems and policies behind it as well to give it that rigor in terms of sharing that data with everyone to understand actually this is what we're doing in this particular region and this is what this asset is classed um and then going to the second part of your okay, question about, maybe before you go on to the second point i'd like to challenge you on that because of course, in an ideal world, we have the data, and then we can set the policy according to the data. Mm. But I don't know if we have time for that. No, we don't. And no. Is there some, not some way that we can piggyback on a certain amount of studies and works and um, mm. different experimentation that have already been going on across Europe? And notably, I'm thinking of France uh, that did a long period of uh experimentation on whole life carbon um before they came out with their re 2020 regulation could we not piggyback on some of those experiences to set targets now and then refine them as time goes on and we have more data um should we always wait for everything to be perfect before we can set a target that i'm worried we're not gonna we're 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 not gonna make it what do you think yeah. emmett no, I mean we're not waiting for perfection here. We're, we're it's the moral choice. It's the financial choice. It's the moral choice. We have to act now. We have to do the best we can. When you know us as a profession, it's an ethical, moral choice that we have to make. And yes, it will, in maybe the short term, cost more capital. 
but you've got to look at what that impact has in the next 60, 50, you know, you know in, that, in the lifespan of that asset. We, we are short of time, as you said. We have, you know, if we, were, if we were looking at this issue maybe 20 years ago, 30 years ago, we could have had an impact on where we are in terms of that 1.5. We could have made it, we could have, could have started that kind of decrease in, in, in our carbon uh, offload. But, you know, to, this, to get to the stage where we're at today, we carry on the way we are. We're doubling, I think, the, 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 the kind of numbers where we double the amount of carbon that's emitted from, especially from the construction industry as we are with that 40%. So we have to look at what we can do to start reducing that now. There's nothing else stopping us. Um, yes, we know that regulation hasn't been set uh, by our peer countries, but we have a moral obligation to do that so now. So, you know, we've taken the stance, we've, we've done the methodology, we've understood how to measure. Um, we're not we're not asking for people to wait for policy to come out, but we're making sure that we actually reduce as we go ahead. Um, policy will make its you know will shape its form, and you know RSCS is part of that in terms of shaping that. But we have to make sure that we have a moral obligation now. I think, and yes, we are you know yeah. we are late to the game. I think. Yeah, thank you, thanks, Amit, and um, that that was that was great. Uh, I, I absolutely was just being devil's advocate there. Mm. Um, I think we're starting to field a few questions from the audience, and um, I'd like to. Uh, so we we have about 15 minutes left in the session, so I'm going to start um, passing those on. Um, the first question is, and and I think, as I said, Julie did respond in part to this. Based on our experience, what is the biggest challenge faced by projects? owners, developers to put this into practice? And what do you think the key role of consultants and engineers will be to support that? Who would like to field, uh, in addition to what Julie said about the challenges, who would like to field that question? Maybe, maybe Luca? Consultants and engineers, how can they support putting into practice whole life carbon? Yes, I mean, they would say, you know, that the fact that they can advise, you know, uh, when property developer or investor comes to them, you know, to inform what is actually the best in practice that can be done, you know, like uh, not necessarily that all developer would know what could be done and how it can be done so you know like i think demonstrating that more you know like of course consultant and engineer and then the broader architect uh, sector they need to know what can be done but they would be probably ideally the best place to know that it can be done how technically it can be done and what is actually required so if a uh, design doesn't meet the requirement for net zero I would suggest I would say that you know they would be the best one to advise that actually that can more can be done. So they would have the, the role and responsibility to do that. Uh, so and many of these are actually signing up to commitment to meet that. Uh, uh, some of them are like architect declare, engineering declare commitment. Some of them are more uh, formal, like science based target, which by the way is going to launch their buildings. Um, guide on the 21st of November. So in a couple of weeks, they will launch the new guide for science-based target for the for buildings. So that's definitely an important milestone for company to link up and looking what does it mean setting a science-based target uh, based on buildings. So yeah, it's really kind of making sure that they are, they are advised. Mm -hmm. I, I think, no, I think you're you're right. We've got to put the onus on at that kind of uh, you know the optioneering and feasibility point of view. You know, in those choices of materials, the choice of the position of the buildings, looking at systems, looking at at particular HVAC and ventilation systems, we need to look way up. You know, further up that design change where we can make the most amount of impact, because that's where we think we've seen the the biggest impact at that kind of. Uh, optioneering phase of, of choices of material, choices of location, choices of certain criteria, um, and then that will hopefully start indicating that we can use different types and availability of materials, then decreasing the load of carbon uh, further down the in terms of the construction line. So consultants do play a pivotal part in that. 
Excellent. And I think that actually leads on to a question from Frank, who asks, are calculations being made on available raw material resources required for continent-wide transformations via new technologies? If I understand correctly, Frank, that question is about are we calculating and optioneering the value, the carbon value of new and raw materials? Oh, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so so who wants to, to answer that question about is there are there calculations being made on on raw material resources and are new technologies helpful? Julie, you want to field that one? Yeah, I'm wondering. I mean, uh, maybe yeah. Uh, I I didn't say it when I introduced myself, but I, I used to be a, a climate policy analyst working for a think tank. Um, so I I know that there are you know there is research on that topic right there is a lot of research i think also if you think of the amount of uh raw materials you need to uh, put in enough wind turbines and uh, solar panels and that's why we also then based on such research said you know energy efficiency first because anything else just requires a lot of resources i'm also trying to understand the question um I, I would think when Frank asked the questions, it's about are the calculations made at the building level, which then, I'm, I mean, yes, to some extent, there is the, um, so I'm not an engineer, but um, you know, the, the quantity of, the, the bill of quantity or quantity of bills, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, Luca, please come in. So at the building I, I level. Mean, then. Kind of, I mean, also like looking at the question from Stalin, uh, I just see that, you know, like, uh, there is uh, generally, you know, like uh, when you do calculation, the best would be to do it with primer, primer, uh, primer data, primary data, you know, based on the information that you have. That obviously is not always the case. So ideally, you know, like if you have EPDs, environment product declaration that enables to kind of make the calculation with some consistency based on, you know, like uh, available information. But yeah, the big challenge, and I mean, it was, Amit was saying that before, you know, like uh, transparency and consistency of data is definitely a big challenge. So, but that doesn't have to stop us from doing the calculation because, you know, like uh, being 70, 80% right is better than 0% at the moment. So, you know, like starting to get the numbers in, starting to get information, getting closer. So by having a common framework to measure and calculate would enable to understand being transparent in that and now to, under, to find to understand where are we how far what what, the, what is in and what is out and then enables to do different things so then as well one thing that is important is that we should not look at only the materials that we put in you know i i personally think there is no such thing as a low carbon material because it all depends on how it's used you know we, there is such more potential to make use of materials in much more efficient way also like high carbon intense materials if they're used much efficient much more efficiently they can lead to better performance so that's why the whole like carbon calculation is important because we should not look at what we put in but what is the final output of the product you know when we look at the entire building being constructed and finalized what is the final embodied carbon what is the final operational emissions of the building what is the final whole life carbon so when we look at the performance, that's what matters because then we know we made use of the best material in the best way. And then of course, making use of the low uh, embodied carbon materials, made, uh, you know, there is various ways that can be measured to reduce, but the important is to look at the performance. What is the final output of carbon emission when we look at the thing? And oh, all yeah. materials, all technology are part of the solution. That I think is very important, that especially in the built environment, which is such a long value chain. There is so many different things that gets together. So there is no one silver bullet, but by making sure we use all different solutions, we can definitely get there. But we need to look at the final performance more than just kind of uh, picking one or two solutions that bring us there. I think let's go Thanks. back to the 
sorry, Tina, I just yeah. want to say, you know, when we talk about materials, we look at the high carbon intensity materials, so, such as steel and concrete, you know, probably 99% of, you know, all structures that have contained those two elements of, of putting up buildings. So we either need to invest in, in technology to produce new materials that are carbon negative or, you know, carbon uh, neutrality, or, you know, just having a different method of construction. So it is, it is a real reshape, a rethink, if we're really planning to get down to, you know, to 2050 goals. Um, mm. you know, you're not trying to eliminate those two kind of building materials, but they are the essence of building. Yeah, no, I, I think you're absolutely right there, Emmett. And I think there's a lot to be said about um, the waste hierarchy, which is uh, re remain, retain, sorry, retain, reuse, uh, recycle, um, some of the answers uh, to the carbon and steel issues may be that we have more retrofitting. Um, and that uh, we do have a question on, and I'm sorry, we are running out of time. So we, uh, I think, will be able to get back to these questions offline in a uh, report that we're going to be publishing after this call. So um, please don't feel frustrated. We will get to your questions, but just not on this particular recording. I'd like a final question before I close um, for all speakers, and I want it to be just one sentence, no more, of your takeaways or recommendations that you want to emphasize for policymakers or professionals in the built environment around this topic. One sentence, please. Um, Amit. I think the biggest one for me is we, we've got the next 30 years to undo the last 200. Um, and if that doesn't make an impact on you know where we are, then I, I don't know what will. Great, Julie. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, I, I noted that we discussed you know the lack of data uh, and and how to get there as a business on the journey, uh, how to report on whole life carbon, and I think uh, you know from our network what we, what we see from the front runners is that if you want to get equipped for upcoming regulation, you can also turn to voluntary reporting frameworks. Uh, there's a lot out there and kind of no matter which one you pick, all of them will to some extent put you on the right path. And once you are complied with one, it's going to be much easier to be compliant with others and also regulation in the future. So, you know, you can just pick and choose from the market and, and start okay. your own. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Luca, one sentence. 2030 is now because I mean we need to start now if we want to achieve the 2030 objective so we cannot delay further we need to look at it now so 2030 is 2030 is today Zolt you've got the final word yeah I think this discussion or, or sentence. <laughs> yeah yeah well I think this life cycle discussion requires upscaling and that means I think we can look also I to learn from the lessons of rolling out energy efficiency policies. But certainly we don't have the luxury of the last 20 years, so we need to act right now. And we also don't have the luxury to make any mistakes. So, but we have the opportunity to correct some of the mistakes of the past. Thank you. Thank you, Zolt, Julie, Luca, and Amit for your contributions today. This has been a very, very information packed and interesting discussion. If you want to hear any of their points again, we'll be publishing a recording of this webinar on the RICS website, where you can also find recordings of previous webinars. Before you go, please take a moment to let us know what you thought by completing the online poll, which will appear on your screens at the end of the webinar. You can also follow us on X, Instagram, and LinkedIn, where you can receive news of upcoming webinars and catch up on any issue that you may have missed. Cutting emissions is tough, but before we can cut with confidence, we need to measure with consistency. A clear methodology that can inform surveys, project plans, investments, and operations will be a vital step in understanding, reducing, and mitigating our climate impacts. Thank you all for joining us Thank you to the stellar panel, Julie, Luca, Amit, Zolt. And until next time, goodbye. Goodbye, thank you. Bye-bye.